Do you think you've seen a ghost? If so, you're probably not alone. But the atmosphere in here is electric. But would you ever imagine that even the latest technology could prove ghosts exist? You feel the coldness coming out? For three months, a team of ghost hunters have ventured to some of Britain's spookiest places to prove the paranormal. Places where the ghosts of those who died horribly apparently choose to return. Wake up, you two! Ready for eternity! No! And haunted homes where spirits seem determined to let their presence be known. Oh my God! What's that? Look! Look. But one thing's certain, chasing ghosts can be an interesting business. Marion, will you leave, please? Now! Leave her now! Especially when seances get out of control. Get it out. Oh! It... tried to kill me! Margate, a bustling seaside town on the Kent coast and home to one of Britain's oldest stages, the Theatre Royal. Double, double, toil and trouble, fire, burn and cauldron, bubble. Oh, yes. Theatres, fascinating places, hotbeds of passion and emotion, where dreams are fulfilled or hopes cruelly dashed amid the maelstrom of tragedy, romance and suspense played out on this stage. No wonder that they are popular with ghosts. Take the Theatre Royal in Margate, opened 1787. Imagine the fiery characters that have passed through those doors and trodden these boards during the last two and a half centuries. No wonder some of the spirits and souls of those who have either appeared on this stage or worked behind the scenes or sat in the audience may have decided to stay. Margate's Theatre Royal is full of ghosts. But will the ghost detectives be able to produce any evidence that ghosts really do exist at Margate's Theatre Royal? Or will they discover it's all just an illusion? Armed with an array of high-tech equipment, they've got just three days to conduct their investigation. Yeah. With how many adapters? Two or four? He didn't say. Taking that Just many. that one, all right. Okay. okay that's... Should, Thank uh, should you. suffice. Okay. Are you on the infrared camera? Yeah, I'm Okay, I'm going to put that through the main dash this time rather than to a VHS. <laughs> Obviously, as you can see, the beams are blocking most of the view, but uh, from the angle I've got the camera in this corner, we should be able to get the majority of this room illuminated night and day. Ross Hemsworth is team leader. 
Right, we're lucky with this one in that we managed to get a recce done of this venue, so uh, we've actually been here before, so we know where the hot spots are. Uh, so we're actually running cameras across the stage, both sides of the stage, high up in the rigging above the stage, in front of the stage, covering the royal boxes, and up in the balcony. So, quite hopeful that uh, we could have a good investigation. As the ghost detectives settle down for three days round the clock monitoring, another member of the team, clairvoyant Marion Goodfellow, arrives. She believes that the dead have spirits that she can contact. She's never been to the Theatre Royal before. As I was coming down, really standing here, I really felt that, that, that there was either tunnels or, or, or something underneath my feet. And whether or actually there is, the building actually goes, you know, sort of pans out larger than the actual theatre, I don't know. But there's definitely something underneath my feet, I can feel it like causeway, like traffic, like an area, okay? I've almost, I've got a doorkeeper here, I've got a gentleman, um, an oldish gentleman. He's very, very friendly, very, very friendly. Um, quite stocky but very, very quick on his feet, knew, very nimble, knew everything, knew everyone. Uh, people would call him by his first name, and I'm trying desperately to get that first name. I think they'd call him Charlie, but I don't think he's, that's his name. Gives you a feeling of, uh, it's an extremely happy place. Uh, mm. There's been a lot of laughter here. And some terrible tragedies. Oh, yeah. The closer I get to the stage, the more tragedy I feel. And I don't think that's a... So the mediums don't always agree. Why am I being driven up here? Oh, it's, it's quite terrifying, but I'm, I'm completely comfortable up here. I feel like I can fly. I've got somebody here that would have run across there, no trouble at all. I can feel him as if he's standing in my body. Can we get in that room? Or is it dangerous? No, it's full of, full of rubbish. Marion's instincts about the underground tunnels prove correct. It's just amazing. Gosh, I wish I was fit. I'd be in these caverns and places just ferreting around. Oh, look at it, James. It's amazing. It's like a whole little street down here. I've got drunks. I've got drunks. I've got, um, I was just swaying back as before as I've got drunks here. Um, perhaps there was a bar down here, a, a, an old pub or something, you know, but I, I've got sort of drunken, drunken marauders, if you like. Auntie Pat, actress, writer, 1920 to 1994. <laughs> she died aged 74 and in accordance with her last wish found her final resting place cemented here in the theatre's hallowed walls. She's not a troublesome ghost. They all think of her as Auntie Pat, their guardian, and everyone describes her corner of the theatre as warm, comfortable even. But woe betide anyone who blocks Auntie Pat's view. Theatre staff know that when she can't see the stage, the temperature of this area drops radically. Fact or fiction? Does Auntie Pat really haunt the theatre, making her presence known to those who inadvertently block her sight lines? Or is Betty's ghost just another theatrical invention? Hmm? Basically, every time we come in, we have to say, hello, Auntie Pat. We don't have to, but we do. Um, if we cover her up with scenery, the show does go downhill. And if you, as soon as you uncover it, so there's something in it. I don't know what, but there's something in Auntie Pat. 
but she's been there a while now. The other Boxing Day, we were busy with only about four of us and the staff and a full house. I was in the flies pulling the scenery up and down. My technician was on the switchboard and all of a sudden things started to go wrong. The, the switchboard crashed, half the lights failed. I put the wrong scenery in without knowing and it was general mayhem. And then someone actually said to me, have you said good morning to Aunt Pat? Well, both me and Justin had said, oh no, we haven't. It started to go right from there on. Now, again, it's one of those things, but we've now got the habit of saying good morning or good night to Aunt Pat. But will Aunt Pat make her presence known to the team? As the ghost watch continues, investigator Andy Matthews gets a strange calling to the stage. Well, I was sitting up in the control room and uh, I suddenly got the impression that I should go downstairs with this digital camera. I don't know why. Um, so I did that, walked onto the stage, um, put my arms out and said, OK, if there's anybody here, can you possibly let me know that you are here? So I said, OK, I'll give it a bash. And I, sat, I, st I stood there and the first I pointed the camera to stage right, then I pointed it to stage left. Then I had a complete change of direction, took two steps back over here, Stood here, took another two steps back, and fired off a shot, expecting obviously nothing. But we got three orbs. Quite incredible. I don't know how it happened. <laughs> it uh, can be a bit spooky, can't it? Or, you know, we don't know what's going on. But uh, so, what was the feeling you got that made you think? The I don't know. Was down here? It was nothing. It was just just popped into my head. I'm going to go downstairs and take a photograph. It's difficult to explain this type of thing. You know, it's it's it just hits you like an idea does sometimes and you just go with your own instincts and I felt that I had to come down here with a digital camera and try it out and uh, hey presto there we go <laughs> so yeah I'm quite pleased with that what's, what's, you know, what's the theory about orbs what are these balls of light or what might they be well the main, the main theory is that they're the, uh, what's left of the human spirit once the, the body and you know, flesh blood and bone dies um, that's the energy part of the human spirit that survives and goes on to heaven knows where um, it's just the energy it's just an energy ball that's, that's as, as much as we can dare to, to hazard a guess at really um, I don't think it's camera phenomena um, I don't think it's dust if it is dust they're very intelligent pieces of dust um, they just seem to pop up not on command but nine times out of ten if a sensitive feels that there's one there and a shot is taken special on digicam then nine times out of ten they're going to get a result and I can't explain that it's one of, the, one, of the, one of the great fascinating parts about doing this kind of work. You know, the more you do it and the more evidence you see, the more you, you, you want to carry on and find out what is actually going on. Andy is convinced that the orbs are no camera trick. But some experts suggest that they are a common feature with the lenses of digital cameras that are super sensitive to reflections and rogue light sources. Uh, I've got another one. Other investigations have also shown the orbs to be particles of dust. But who better to know about the paranormal at the theatre than those who work there day and night? Richard Thomas is the technical director of this theatre and for the most part he and the rest of the staff coexist with the ghosts. They're just part and parcel of the job. But not all ghosts are benign and friendly. Late one night, Richard was closing down the theater. Nothing unusual, same routine every night, but something struck him as unusual that night. Richard first noticed that five of the theater seats all in a row were down, as if sat on by five invisible friends. From a distance, he just assumed the seats needed oiling. But as he drew closer, he could hear the sound of the rustling of feet and the creaking of floorboards. His bravery waned as he got closer, edging slowly towards the seats. And when he was just feet away, the seats suddenly flipped up with a massive clap. Richard was paralyzed with fear. He tried to rationalize the situation, coming to the conclusion that the vibrations from the old building must have caused them to suddenly free themselves. But as he walked past the seats, he noticed a chill in the air, a coldness in just five seats. 
He could contain his fear no more and backed away from the seat slowly. And as he did so, his eyes fixed on the five seats. Four of them flipped back down, slowly. One, two, three, four. Richard froze, his eyes fixed on the fifth seat. He backed off again, and suddenly the seat flew down with such force that the whole row of seats shook and the clatter echoed through the darkened theatre. He ran as fast as he could, leaping over seats in his efforts to escape. He swears to this day that he could hear guffaws of laughter from behind him. Compared to some of the theatre's visitors, though, Richard was rather lucky. Oh, yes. He was rather lucky. So far, video cameras have yet to record any trace of the Theatre Royal's ghosts. But another clairvoyant member of the team arrives, Paul Hanrahan. He appears to make contact with Sarah, one of the theatre's most reported ghosts. If I'm not careful, I'm going to go into trance, and I don't want to do that now, so can I stop, please? Sorry. Uh... <coughs> Can they really communicate with the dead? Join us later. The ghost detectives are on the case at the Theatre Royal in Margate and are hoping to find a ghost of one of its more celebrated actresses, Sarah Thorne. Before arriving at the theatre, Another member of the team, clairvoyant Paul Hanrahan, claims to have had a premonition about Sarah. But what would he feel now? So this is the first time I've been in this building. Um, I feel something's happened in this building which has brought sadness. I don't know what, it's just that as you walk in here there's a feeling that hits you in emotionally, of a loss of some sort. Um, and I feel it, it's feminine sort of energy. That's all I've got at the moment. I'll let you know what else I get as I'm going around. <coughs> but could the feminine energy be Sarah's? Ooh. Sarah Thorne dedicated her whole life to the stage, and in particular the Theatre Royal here in Margate. In 1885, she opened a school of acting here and ran it with an iron fist until her death of influenza in 1899. For 14 years, she was the theatre's lifeblood. And it is said that Sarah has never been able to leave the place that she loved. But is it possible for Paul to detect Sarah's ghost after all this time? And I want to go back just over 100 years. That's what I'm being told. Go back just over a hundred years for to place this lady. And she's telling me she would have worked here, so she wouldn't have been somebody who visited to watch something. She's telling me that she would have worked here or had some connection to this building. Unhappy that modern students are failing her standards, she has her own way of ensuring that discipline is maintained. During a rehearsal in 1934, Sarah's apparition appeared in a circle, moaning and groaning at the performance. The dumbstruck car stared in awe as the ghostly figure rose to the ceiling and one of the dancers fainted in terror. She's bringing a lot of emotion with her. Um, what sort of emotion? It's 
emotion, uh, just emotion, deep emotion. I don't know whether it's... Sorry. Uh, <coughs> <coughs> that Sarah existed is not in question. Like countless others, her passion for the Theatre Royal is literally undying. But who's to say that her uncompromising spirit has never left? Legend or unbelievable lie? Well, I was asked to help in the fixing of the seating uh, after the war when this theatre was due to be opened again. And we had to be open by five o'clock the next evening, which meant that we had to work all night to achieve this end. About between 1 and 3 a.m., we decided to have a cup of tea from a flask and sat up in the gods up there in the centre. And during this period, this figure walked across the stage out towards the stage door. And it looked like a figure of a tall, slim lady. And what did it make you feel like? Well, it was very frightening. I could hardly believe it. Uh, but I, at that point, I wasn't, uh, you know, aware of this resident ghost that was supposed to be here. It was only when I related it to someone later that I found out. And I said, well, that must have been it, Sarah Thorne. And uh, it was quite uh, frightening, quite frightening. So how did you act? What did you do? Well, uh, after it went, I, 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 you know, I just didn't know what to make of it never having seen an apparition in my life. To be quite honest, I didn't really want to come in, in here anymore. I stayed away, yes, I, I never came in again. And uh, I was rather, you know, rather scared. Reams never returned to the theater until this day. Perhaps he had good reason. In the control room, the team believe they have detected strange objects floating above the auditorium during rehearsals. Macbeth, 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 the where Macduff. OK, we've just been looking at the mini cams upstairs and the, the main mini cam that's facing out is picking up orbs, quite a few of them moving in the upper bo balcony, the upper circle, uh, moving left to right, some at quite high speed, quite bright. Uh, we're recording that upstairs at the moment. I'm just trying to see if I can verify it with a second camera at the moment without any luck. Um, we're getting some lens flare and that on here, but we're not actually seeing the orbs on this one at the moment. But as I zoom into the area where the minicams are catching it, it's very dark, so I'm not really getting a very clear picture. He will not be commanded. Here's another. More potent than the first. Look there. 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 OK, just to eliminate the, the um, ones we had before, where is that camera position? Is it the one in the second box? Uh, yes. Right, we've got four spotlights on the side of that box which are giving us four light beams directly in front of camera. So I think we could have dust again there. Unlike the orbs photographed on stage by Andy, these are more easily explained. Let Mark get on with what he's doing. I'm going to go up there and just investigate. But I think you'll find it'll be light beams across. So it'll be close to lens. So it's probably going to be dust. False alarm, I think. To time a mortal custom, yet my heart throws to know one thing. Tell me if your art. While the ghost detectives continue to search for proof, there's one man who needs no convincing that the ghosts exist. Theatre manager Michael Wheatley Ward. We, we had a clairvoyant here about six years ago and I'd often wondered why I'd been connected with this theatre most of my life. And um, it turned out that um, this particular spirit gun I've got uh, was connected with the theatre when it was first opened. It was a owner of a barge and it turned out to be Charlie Mate, um, the, one, of the founder, one of the two founders. Uh, so I've taken this in my stride and I often think that he's around me at moments of difficult decisions and he's helped me make them.
it might sound as though I'm absolutely raving bonkers, but if I, if I get any problems, um, I start to think to myself, well, what would Charlie say? And sometimes an answer must mysteriously appears. I can't be any more clearer than that. And I suppose a lot of people looking at me will think, well, he's stark staring mad, but I, I've come to believe in it. <laughs> <laughs> the farmer's daughter has married the vicar's son. He said they will make a lovely couple because she is a Quaker and he wants his oats. <laughs> While most performances here are excellent, like any other theatre, the Theatre Royal in Margate has its off nights. But unlike any other theatre in the world, here we have our own in-house critic. Charlie Mate is his name. What's more, he died many years ago. He's regularly seen and heard wandering in the cellars under the stage. But when a performance is less than impressive, he appears across the road from the theatre, standing at the bar of the nearest pub. And regular drinkers all swear blind that he vanishes the moment the curtain comes down. I was standing behind the bar where Sheila is now as I was standing there, Linda was just by here and her husband and his friend was playing with my dog on the floor. And then all of a sudden it was just like for some unknown reason we both turned around together as if there was a movement. And as we looked, he was standing here. And she looked at me, I looked at her and we both looked at each other and I said, did you see what I saw? And she went... I'm not sure what you saw. And they were too busy, so they, they'd had a few anyway, so, and we'd just finished work. And then the next thing is, she started to tell me roughly what he was wearing, and I finished it off for Between the two of us, we actually described what he was wearing. I was sat here one night, talking to other people, and well, yeah, well mainly I was sat on my own, and I felt this pressure against me as if something was trying to get pushed into me. And I was told afterwards that uh, I was crying and Rose had said she thought that the jukebox had upset, so, uh, music on the jukebox had upset me. But I, um, you'd have to ask her if she actually heard me say, um, go away, leave me alone. Don't touch me, get away from me. David was sitting and he'd just gone into it, and I thought he was actually reminiscing about his past with the music. I thought it'd upset him, and I went to say, are you all right, David? And the next thing, the tears were just dripping down his face, and he was like this. Go away, go away, go away, you can't come through me. And, and it was like, I can't explain it, he was just saying, go away. I was frightened. Um, I, was afraid, I, was, um, I wasn't so much upset because I've had a, a couple of other experiences that but I was afraid at the time and I, all I wanted to do was leave me alone. He seemed to be pressuring me. If uh, it, um, it let me go quite nice and easy, it might have been better. It wasn't until afterwards that I thought about it that um, he seemed to want to get inside me so he could put his side of the story or his words over. This sounds stupid because a lot of people think you're cranky. But I've got to say, the only way I can describe him is that he's not the Sandy Man pork bottle. And that is the only way I can put it. But he has got something around the neck that is either a ruff or a scarf. And I'm going to move because at the moment I'm going cold from it to tie neck cold. I'm ever so sorry. But that is where he would be. Others believe there is a more rational explanation. Now it's quite interesting that when you look at the kind of places that are typically said to be haunted, you tend to find that there are places like castles, uh, hotels, pubs and so on. Now it may be just a coincidence that it turns to be these places. I mean clearly they've got a lot of history so there's lots of events that will have taken place over the years but also it probably isn't bad for business if 
you know, people, if, if a myth develops that you know, the, the place is haunted, it's probably going to draw more people in than it's actually going to send away. Now, again, and particularly in the case of pubs, then you, you've got a situation there where people may often kind of uh, maybe have had one too many. And uh, I think maybe one or two of the instances that we hear about you know, are genuinely due to spirits, but maybe not the kind of spirits that psychics would have us believe. As night falls, the team's clairvoyants believe they can make contact with the Theatre Royal's ghosts by staging a seance, a gathering of those who claim to possess psychic powers. Heavenly Father, Divine Spirit, First, they say a prayer. Protection and guidance this evening. We ask that we all be allowed to work with your realm and unite the two worlds together to bring the fourth proof of survival. We ask this in love and in light. Amen. Amen. Is there anybody here that wishes to speak to us? Is there somebody there? A succession of spirits appears to come to Marion as she slips into a trance. James Howard. Hello, James. How do you do? How do you do? Is there somebody else here? <clears throat> Tommy, Gov. Tommy. Hello, Tommy. Hi. Isn't hi a very modern greeting? And what do you do, Tommy? Do you work here? Yeah. I could see you. What's your name? My name's Sarah. Hello, Sarah. Hello. What did you used to do? Sarah's spirit doesn't answer. But after apparently making contact with a number of the theatre's more friendly resident ghosts, the ghost detectives were oblivious to the stories of a far more malevolent spirit lurking 50 feet above their heads in the fly tower. Just 24 hours to go at the Theatre Royal in Margate, the ghost detectives are focusing their attention on the fly tower 50 feet above the stage. Clairvoyant Paul Hanrahan is sent to investigate. Right, well, as you come up to the top of the, the stairs, as the floor levels out, there's a very strong presence there of a gentleman. He's not very tall, very thin of build, very agile sort of gentleman, and he's given me the name of George. Um, and I don't feel very comfortable up here. And I feel that this George would have been involved in an attempted murder. He's quite a strong presence. I feel you'd have been up here quite on quite a frequent basis. And I feel he'd have been peeping, looking for somebody. I feel he either had a grudge or, or, or some problem with another individual who would have been in this theatre. I, I don't want to go near the edge. I feel that I'm in this area here, which is where he would have um, done whatever he did. Not down there, not over there, but right here. And I am not comfortable going to the edge there. And just like I'm not comfortable standing by the stairs. I don't know... He, when you're standing there, it does feel as if he wants to try and push you back down the stairs. The fly tower is no place for the faint-hearted at the best of times. As the story goes, 
The theater's upper reaches are haunted by the ghost of an ancient mariner. It's said that ropes and timbers taken from a shipwreck off the coast of Margate were used to build the scenery gantries. But with the plundered material of the wreck came one of its earliest minders, as stage manager Justin discovered. Yes. I think it was last panto. It might have been the one before. I can't remember now. Um, I was up in the fly tower, which you'll probably see a bit later on. Um, uh, for reasons I know, I don't know why I was why I was standing on it. We've got these little cleats where you tie all the ropes, so you lift the you know the cloths out. Um, all the crew were downstairs, and I was being lazy upstairs watching them basically. Um, flew one of the cloths out, tied another one off. They were tying more cloths on, and I stood where you tie the cleats. Um, stupid, really, because you could fall. I mean, it's, there's nothing there at all. Standing on there, and um, felt a bit creepy up there. Um, and I felt a guy literally blowing me face, and it, it, I couldn't see him. I must admit, I did not see him. But you know when someone, you know, you know what I mean when someone's right in front of you, blew me in the face. Definitely felt that, and I fell backwards, luckily backwards, into the fly floor, and then promptly ran down the stairs. And I was being, it felt like I was being chased, although no one's touching. You know, you know what I mean. No one's touching you, but they're right there. And I ran down the stairs, and I still don't like up there now. The fly tower above the stage seems to be the focus of paranormal energy, according to the ghost detectives, who also believe a seance is the only way to coax its spirits into the open. But none of the team was prepared for what was to happen next. The clairvoyants have dispensed with their usual prayers before a seance, and Marion appears to slip immediately into a trance. Marion's lunge for the ropes saw her inches away from a fatal drop to the stage below. Go down. You must remain You must seated. stay down. Remain Sit seated. Sit down. We'll remove you. Sit down. Calm down. All we want to do is talk to you. All we want to do is talk. The team believes that a powerful spirit has taken control of Marion and refuses to leave. Hello, you have to leave Marion now. Leave Marion now, please. Now. Now. Leave her now. Marion, can you hear me? Right, will you leave, please? Now! Leave her now! With Marion still seemingly possessed, the spirit appears to be trying to communicate. There's a pen. It's okay. You can draw it up, watch. See? It's all right. We mean you know okay. harm. It's okay. Get back in the shadows, eh? Punch, Drew. Punch, Drew. No, it's alright. It's alright. It's a punch. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. What didn't you do? Punch. Drew, punch, punch. No, it's okay. You understand. Who said you did? An old stage prop appears to be upsetting the spirit, although it's unclear why. It's all right. Just, Just keep blocking over you that way. Take it away. Take it away. What do you want to say? Take it away. Take what away? Like that. That thing there. No, I know you, you didn't. didn't. Do it. I know, I know you, you didn't. didn't do it. It's, all it's okay. Right. It's okay. It's we, over now. We believe you. You can. It's over now. You can't down. Down. It's down. It's down. It's down. It's down. It's down. If she wants it down. Right. Okay. Sleep. Don't worry. She will come back out of it naturally. Yeah. The second time. No. <laughs> 
Marion? <gasps> Marion? <gasps> she is very upset. Oh, it, he tried to kill me. Yeah, right. like, Marion, are you, are you there? She's back. She's back. <sighs> The following day, some of the team are still shaken by the apparent events during the previous night's seance. First and foremost, this is probably the most exciting seance we've ever had. Um, I've seen some mahas go into some sort of characters before now. Uh, I've never seen anything like this one. This was something else. Um, and you had that feeling there. You know, it was times that, you know, the energy sitting around you made your hair stand on end. The story that I believe um, that he was, he was trying to put over was the fact that he had been um, so accused of murdering somebody by punching them and they'd been f and gone over the fly tower. Now, to me, that suggests that it couldn't have been an actor. It's actually somebody backstage, somebody who works backstage doing the rigging or whatever. And th obviously this guy died. It, it was either an accident or he wasn't even involved and just got totally accused of it. How much of that were you aware of? Not much at all. You'd need to speak to the others. Um, I feel this was really my responsibility. Um, we'd been hanging around all day, not really doing any work, um, i.e. spiritual work. And we weren't investigating. We were, we were just hanging around basically all day. And, you know, I'd become sort of agitated by that. And so I knew that we were in a theatre. Um, I'd felt on the walk round that, that there was a presence up there. So if you like, I was very naughty and I evoked that spirit. I asked that spirit to come into me. And that is exactly what happened. I didn't wait for the set circle um, protection. We didn't have a prayer. I just went straight for it. Um, and we suffered the consequences. But could it have been the group's beliefs at work rather than the spirits? Now, it's very interesting that at one point Maz appears in a state of possession, apparently, to be about to throw herself off the balcony, and all the others, naturally enough, try and stop her from doing that. Now, I mean, it's, it's very interesting to ask the question, what would have happened if none of them had responded that way? Would she have actually done it? Now, I'll have to put my hands up here and say, you know, I don't actually know. It really does depend on the degree to which she was involved in the role that she was actually engaged in there, it may have been that she might have actually gone so far as that. I suspect she probably wouldn't, to be perfectly honest. I think there'd be some of the dramatic interruption, I mean, you know, there's all sorts of things that could have happened in that context. She might have just frozen, or she might have collapsed, or all sorts of things would have happened. But I don't think that she would have actually come to any harm. I mean, in these kind of situations, there are lots of kinds of unspoken rules. In the, in the old days, when the original Victorian seances used to take place, it was claimed that if anyone attempted to touch the medium during the actual seance, then the medium would die. And in fact, needless to say, there are no cases on record where that actually happened. But yeah. I think we don't know how Maz would have actually reacted if she hadn't been stopped, but everybody was so involved in playing their roles in that situation that there was probably very little danger that that would actually take place. With the investigation virtually over, researcher Susie is unable to unearth any evidence of a death from the fly tower. And despite 24-hour surveillance, the cameras also fail to capture any hard evidence. Margate's Theatre Royal clearly enjoys a plethora of ghost stories many of which are corroborated by witnesses still living today. But the ghost detectives found little scientific evidence this time. However, nothing can explain these extraordinary events. Stay down. Sit down. Sit down. Oh. <clears throat> it, I mean, 
trying to kill me? 